It's a real privilege to be able to address all of you this day. In the midst of the losses we've experienced in our lives in the past year, now more than a year, the new ways that people have come together intentionally to form new kinds of communities in the wake of physical isolation has been a rare silver lining for us all. Not too many years ago, uh, one of my predecessors as pastor, Chuck Boyd, a longtime fixture of our sermon roster, would routinely quote the Beatles song, Eleanor Rigby, uh, that when he gave a sermon in Toronto, he felt like Father Mackenzie writing the words for a sermon that no one will hear. Well, that joke no longer applies. <laughs> for all the members of the local Toronto congregation who had been pondering, shutting their doors, frankly, a decade ago, the ability to receive guest ministry from all around the world has been an affirmation of their, of our past building efforts and a great blessing as they, as we hear the gospel in many tongues in this, our own church service, whether they're experiencing it on a tablet, a phone, or a computer from the safety of their own homes. This is a great miracle to have lived, and it's still worthy of reflecting even as it has become a weekly routine. For Leandro, for myself, for Mike, Christian, for Mary Jean, Parker, Roger, and all the volunteers in the Beyond the World Walls team, the response from all of you around the world to this ministry has been miraculous and soul-sustaining. It has made all of the work worthwhile as the labor has been carried out and received in love with nothing done in vain. For all of you, for this community we share, I am profoundly grateful. Moreover, it is my testimony that the work we are doing here has a vital benefit, not just to ourselves and the church, but to all the communities we touch and ultimately to the whole human family. Our text today is the finale of the earliest gospel account of the Easter story, the last chapter of the Gospel of Mark. In the story, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, three of the female apostles go to the tomb where Jesus' body had been placed, only to find the gate stone rolled away and the body missing. Someone dressed in white, in later tellings, this is explicitly called an angel or even multiple angels, but here is called a young man. Someone in white testifies that Jesus has been resurrected. The women then flee the tomb in terror and amazement. And the gospel says, they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. And that's the end of the book. <laughs> From antiquity, that ending has been unsatisfying to multiple readers, a few of whom decided to add more to the story. Uh, experiences, for example, they'll write in of the disciples with the risen Christ. So growing up, you may have had the additional 11 verses of what's called now the longer ending to Mark, and they're attached to the gospel in your Bible, and you might not have ever been aware that they aren't in the original manuscripts. At least two readers were so unsatisfied with Mark's text that they fully reworked the Gospel of Mark into their own texts. Those became the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. What the author of Mark was thinking, we can only speculate. But we can probably agree that to leave off at this moment in the story is challenging. It's challenging to us as readers. What comes next? How was this gospel, the message that we've internalized throughout reading Mark's text, this text that continually draws us in and is constantly asking us as readers and disciples, who do you say that Jesus was? Who do, you, who do we say that Jesus is? How was this gospel to be spread after the women fled and said nothing? Looking at it from the perspective of history, we can say that although no one realized it at the time, Christianity began 
when Jesus' apostles, female and male, experience visions of the risen Jesus. Multiple early sources, including Mark here, named Mary Magdalene as the first apostle to testify of Jesus' resurrection. While this would have provided comfort to the members of this movement, uh, which, I'm sorry, this movement of which Jesus had been a key leader, none of those who were part of it would have yet seen this event, these visions of the risen Jesus, as pivotal in the foundation of a new world religion. At best, the group might have seen itself as a school of thought or perhaps a sect within Second Temple Judaism, much like the other sects or schools, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes. None of them would have called themselves Christians on the first Easter or frankly used phrases like the first Easter. The book of Acts asserts that the name Christian did not develop until years later to distinguish members of what was then emerging as a distinct religious tradition uh, among a group of, of what became known as Christians then in the Greek city of Antioch, which was the capital of Roman Syria. As the vision of the risen Jesus was experienced more broadly among the apostles, it began to change the character of the movement and how it understood itself. In the case of Saul of Tarsus, the spiritual experience became the rock of his testimony, transforming him from antagonist to zealous convert, missionary, and church planter. As they reflected on their experiences, Paul, Saul, now Paul, and the other early leaders, perhaps including Mary Magdalene, uh, as well as Jesus' brothers, James and Jude, and his disciples, Peter, John, and others, they all began to discern that the risen Jesus was, against all expectations, the promised Messiah. And they began to understand that the good news or gospel was in fact universal. A new Israel and covenant that applied to all peoples and not simply to an exclusive bloodline. As communities of converts spread rapidly in the Greek-speaking cities of the Roman Empire, members of the emerging religion came to be known as Christians after the Greek word for Messiah, Christos. Although Jesus as Christ was central to the way these Greek-speaking Christian communities understood themselves, Paul actually had very little to say about Jesus' life or teachings. Even the Christians with stronger ties to the communities uh, led by Jesus' brother in Jerusalem, James and Jude, those groups also did not uh, seem initially to have focused much more attention on Jesus, his life or his teachings, than Paul's communities. In our texts that claim descent from James' group, which is sometimes called the poor of Jerusalem, Sayings that we now attribute to Jesus were as likely to be attributed to James or even to Jude. For this group, Jesus was perhaps initially seen as a prophet who was martyred in much the same way as their other prophet leaders had been. John the Baptist, who was martyred, and James, who was later martyred. And so, it was not among those Aramaic-speaking Jewish Christians that the sacred story of, of Jesus' life emerged. It was actually the anonymous evangelists who composed the Gospels. They were drawn from the Greek-speaking Christian communities, and their texts were already seen, seeing the past through the prism of their existing testimony as Christians. Once composed, the canonical Gospel accounts became central to the lived experience of the emerging Christian church, eventually becoming canonized as scripture. And along the way, the text influenced Christian theologians who developed the idea of Christ as God, co-eternal with God's spirit and God the creator as three persons in one eternal God. 
the intellectual and experiential prism through which Christians have understood the divine to this day. It all began then, not with an event in history that anyone would have recorded at the time. Indeed, no one wrote this down or recorded this at the time. Rather, our tradition has grown out of the living experience of continuing revelation, the encounter with the divine shared by Mary Magdalene, by Saul of Tarsus, by the evangelists, the theologians, the canonists, by our ancestors, by our neighbors, by you and me, ongoing today, relived now in our experience of the living Easter and the living Christ this day. It's an experience that is available to all. Sisters and brothers, the experience of the shutdowns of the past year have been unprecedented. The pandemic and our responses to it have resulted in huge numbers of lives lost and incalculable suffering. But we're also aware that the pandemic did not just cause suffering, it exposed and highlighted, stressed and in some cases broke systems in our societies that were already in distress and which were actually weaker and in worse condition than many of us knew or imagined. Certainly we've become aware of income inequality and injustice, the rich-poor divide, which has become almost an insurmountable gaping chasm. We're more aware of systematic racism in our policing and justice systems, unwritten but enforced social norms that require black people to justify their presence in what are default white spaces. White privilege that not only goes unacknowledged and uncorrected, but too often goes completely misunderstood and vigorously and perniciously denied. One of these issues, uh, perhaps from my perspective, one among the most critical in its capacity to unravel the very fabric of our society, one of these issues is the breakdown in the belief or understanding of expertise, of worldviews that are reality-based in favor instead of misinformed, low information, conspiracy theory fueled ways of misviewing and misunderstanding the universe. One of the most recent notorious widespread and dangerous examples is the QAnon conspiracy. This group continues to believe in and promote totally discredited ideas of a cabal of sex traffickers who secretly control the US government. Although the details of the conspiracy are so nonsensical that it would have in the past been difficult to imagine that any rational adult could fall for it, Facebook estimates that the conspiracy's followers actually number in the millions. Every prediction of the QAnon prophet, the source behind this movement, has failed, but just as in religious cults, failed predictions have tended to make the adherents even more zealous. This is a big problem. And it's not just a big problem for the adherents of QAnon who have been deceived. And it's not just a big problem for the people that they are directly ha harassing as trolls online and in person. The entire basis of our so social, economic, and political system is the free adult acting in accor according to rational self-interest. That's just what the foundation of our society is. If vast swashes of society abandon reality-based thinking, if their judgments leave the realm of rationality to inhabit a fantasy land of conspiracy theories and phony victimhood, of grievance culture, the basis of our democracies are completely undermined. The fabric of society so frayed unravels completely. And although we can't generalize from the motives of each individual killer, um, one of the ongoing results is the epidemic of gun violence and mass shootings in the United States, which shows no sign of abate abating. So why do I say all of this in an Easter sermon? What does any of this, you know, what do any of us within my hearing have to do with all of this? What can we do? 
Of course we condemn all these developments and we pray for change. So what's the relevance? In my view, our calling and our community has a special relevance in this moment. These ills, media and internet echo chambers, have become toxic because of the growth and development of negative communities, communities with harmful cultures. But I believe these communities have resulted in part because of the abandonment of positive communities, the dismantling across the developed world of our local congregations. For the first time ever in the United States, the majority of adults surveyed report that they are not a part of any religious community, be it a church, synagogue, mosque, or temple. Well, I'm not saying this is a bad thing for all individuals. I do think there are negative consequences for the loss of institutions where communities can share and explore their spiritual selves. Communities to share life's events, birth, coming of age, marriage, illness and infirmary, infirmity, death. Communities outside of the workplace where struggles with life's meaning can be shared, where common purposes to better society can be leveraged. When these institutions are deconstructed, a void of identity is left. And it's little wonder that negative identities, white supremacy, toxic masculinity, can grow up like cancers to fill the void. The problem is not that religious people are not racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, and the like. Actually, the opposite is the problem too often. The problem is, as, as, the, as the steep as the decline in religion has been generally, the trend has been far more pronounced in thoughtful, progressive traditions like ours, which have grayed and declined in our numbers and in our capacities. Fundamentalist faiths, meanwhile, including extremist groups whose impact on society is a net negative, have fared rather better in perhaps in the past half century. So why should that be? In my reading of history, this trend had its beginning in the era of the Enlightenment, when individual, individuals who considered themselves enlightened, educated, creative, these progressive thinkers, largely chose to leave religion rather than focus their insights on enlightening religion. And there are good reasons why that happened, and churches and regressive clergy share much, perhaps most, of the blame. But I believe we might finally be ready for a do-over. Certainly, I believe this church is poised to reach out to people who have been harmed by narrow-minded enforcement of outdated societal mores and discrimination against classes of people who are traditionally disempowered as our theology has been opened to the whole body for discernment, we can reach out to people trained in critical thinking who have previously written off churches as literalistic and dogmatic. The path we've been on, learning the complex nuance behind our sacred story, shedding simple obedience to fixed rules, and instead contemplating how we are being called to live out the gospel's enduring principles in our own time and place. None of this has been easy. It's been a tough road. Within our community, we have fought a lot along the way in the past half century, and we've lost a lot of people. But I believe we've now achieved something remarkable and wonderful and appealing. We have something that people need without knowing that they have a need. The sacred story of Easter is the miracle of resurrection and renewal. My testimony to all of you is that we are right now experiencing the dawn of a new era. An era, I believe, is going to be one of renewal for the church. Something unprecedented in our history because the world today is unlike it has ever been previously. Seeds we've planted have grown up in hearts all around the world. There are dozens of individuals around the world who were previously not a part of this community 
who have felt a sense of calling, they've joined with us, and they've become vital leaders now in the work. This goes far beyond the walls of Toronto and the Beyond the Walls ministry to local communities of Christ worldwide. I thank all of you who have been with us on this journey for your faithful stewardship in this community. Your openness to following the Spirit to truth, however unexpected or uncomfortable, wherever goodness is found, has brought us to this place. I stand amazed at the journey, and I'm awestruck at the potential for good that lies before us. This Easter, I'm filled with hope. 